Man Manziel's going to be his winner, boy. We're going to get rolling. Good morning. Thank you, guys. Everyone. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us for Physical Therapy Grand Rounds for the month of April. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nick de Blasio. Nick is a facility director at our Orfield Clinic. Um, he is a certified uh, specialist in orthopedic physical therapy and is going to talk about uh, what your gut has to do with headaches. And I hope everyone grabs something to eat because after we're done with Nick, I'm sure we're all going to be extra hungry. <laughs> so thank you very much. Take it away, Nick. Thank you guys for all coming this morning. I appreciate it. Um, I struggled for a while to come up with a topic, I mean, not a topic, a title for this topic because it's, it's not your everyday typical, you know, physical therapy type of a talk. Um, people don't look at the gut and go, yeah, I'm gonna go to therapy for that. But I hope after this presentation, we have a little bit better understanding why this might be relevant to us and, and how it can help a lot of our patients. Um, as, as Seth said, I am the director at the, at the Orfield office. Um, it's myself and other therapists and two assistants. Um, a lot of my background comes from the Institute of Physical Art, and they have a, a uh, advanced certification um, in manual therapy. It's functional manual therapy, it's trademarked right now, um, probably sitting for that examination in the next two or three years. Um, but that's how I got onto this topic. Um, I had gone to a course that they taught, it was called the Upper Quadrant course, and in that course they started talking about this vagus nerve, which I had only done like a few tests on it at you know, some point in my life, but never really learned about it or explored it in, in my practice. Um, and so the, the course talked a, a little bit more about visceral mobilization as well, but then there's you know so many more advanced courses that you can go to on top of that. So I went back to the clinic and I'm like, all right, let, let, me, let me use one of the two of these techniques and see what happens. And uh, from there, I started like really generating an interest in, in this topic because these little techniques that I, were, I was using that I, was, I learned in this course was having a huge effect on my patients. And so I started exploring a little more. And then Steve was like, you want to do grand rounds? I was like, yeah. He's like, what are you going to do it on? I'm like, vagus nerve. He was like, what? I was like, yeah, vagus nerve. And he's like, why? And I was like, I'll tell you. you know. So Greg Johnson is, is the uh, founder of, of the Institute of Physical Art. And this is a quote that he states, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it, because it says, intention is a process, not the end result. Success is having intention. So with our patients, we have little control over our outcomes, okay? Because a lot of the times, it's what we teach our patients to do, okay, outside of when they're with us. So if the intent when you're there working with them, hands-on or through education, is something that you know, your, 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 your process is, that is success. It's when you don't try is when you fail, okay? And failure is a good thing because when you fail – you get onto topics like this. So I've had numerous headache patients, migraine patients in the past where I couldn't fix them. And through failure, you, it pushes you to, to it broaden your horizons, to look harder at what the possible underlying cause is. And in therapists, we have to treat that underlying cause. We have to find what that underlying cause is in order to help our patients, okay? So the objectives here, objectives today, understand the brain-gut axis a little bit more, go over some of the anatomy, kinesiology, physiology, look at the vagus nerve, symptoms, dysfunction of, of, of the vagus nerve, how that relates to gastrointestinal disorders, and how those two interact with why people develop headaches. Um, and we'll also go over a little bit of what, I, what I've done in the clinic and what treatments have been successful with our patients, things to address, cervical dysfunctions, visceral uh, restrictions, and how breathing is really important and how it's a lot of times overlooked. Um, bear with me through this presentation because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to generate a connection for you guys through the presentation, okay? It's not like I'm just going to describe one thing and say this is it. It's, it's a process from the cervical spine and, and, and the brain basically all the way down to our viscera, okay? So questions, what is the clinical, clinical significance between the brain gut axis and headaches and how and why is it relevant to physical therapists? I hope we can kind of answer that today. The brain gut axis, by definition, is the biochemical signaling that takes place between the gastrointestinal tract and the central nervous system, okay? There is a loop, a constant loop going on in our body, okay? We'll get into this a little bit later into what, what uh, nervous system that is. 
So if we re review the relevant anatomy, we'll start up here at the occipital and temporal bones. Um, I'm using my little pointer here. Two points I want to I want to point out. Right here is your occipital bone, and this is your foramen magnum. This is where your brainstem comes out. Okay, and then right over here in the temporal bone, right here is your jugular foramen. Okay, and that's significant because that sits in between the mastoid process, okay, which is here, and your mandibular fossa, which is where your TMJ joint is. Okay, you can palpate that by sticking your finger right underneath your earlobe. It's right there. Okay, and there's four things that come out of there. Cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, and your internal jugular vein. Okay? So, when we talk about upper cervical dysfunctions in a little bit, that area is going to be really important to, 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 to remember, okay? C1, C2, C1 articulates with the occiput, C2 articulates with C1, C2 has a dens, okay, at which C1 rotates around, okay? We're going to talk later about how it gets off axis, okay? So if C1 does not sit on C2 in an efficient alignment, it can consider off axis. Um, note how laterally the, that uh, the transverse process of C1 protrude. If you come off your mastoid process with a therapist, it's right under there. You can feel C1 if you wiggle back and forth, okay? It's very tender, okay? Some muscles that attach to C1 and C2 are your suboccipitals, innervated by the suboccipital nerve. Um, note the orientation of how they how they come from the spinous process. They move both uh, cranially and they move laterally as well. And these these muscles tend to become pretty dysfunctional when you have a postural dysfunction. Okay. Anterior cervical mu musculature. You're looking at longus cap. Oh, sorry. You're looking at longus capitis and longus coli. Those are deep neck flexors, really important. Okay. And then we're looking here at the scalenes. You have three of them, anterior, posterior, and middle. In between the anterior and the middle, you have your brachial plexus and your um, subclavian vein. Okay. Um, sorry, not sub, uh, your subclavian artery. In front of that is where you're going to find, and we'll go over it in a second, where your vagus nerve runs. Okay. And then your your subclavian vein right there. All right. So these 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 muscles are important, and, and they tend to get really spastic and tight with postural deficits, as well as we'll talk about it in a little bit, breathing dysfunctions. Okay. The vagus nerve, tenth cranial nerve, known as the pneumogastric nerve. It's also Latin for wandering because of how large it is. No one really knows how, no one really appreciates how big it is, but it's the largest nerve of the autonomic nervous system in the body. Um, it provides parasympathetic control and influencing the heart, lungs, and digestive tract. Okay? It's responsible for conveying center information about the state of the body's organs to the brain. Okay? It originates here in the medulla oblongata, and again, I told you it passes out of the jugular foramen um, you can see it coming out right there. That is that spot that I asked you to palpate. And then it runs down the neck. You can see how it sends branches off into the uh, larynx through the recurrent um, laryngeal nerve. Okay. That influences voice. Okay. So if you have a dysfunction of, of the vagus nerve, you can have voice deficits. Okay. Also swallowing deficits we'll get into in a little bit. Note here the, the close proximity that you have of the vagus nerve as it exits to the transverse process of C1 and how if we have faulty postures how that might influence this space here how it might narrow or how it actually might put stress on that nerve similarly how a nerve exits out of the lumbar or cervical spine if we have a joint dysfunction okay it's the same principle here you see it's highlighted in green it's passing in front of the the scalene muscles okay and coming posterior to rib one the clavicle the manubrium, okay? Here's a pretty cool picture of it, how large it is. I'm, I'm assuming that this is a, some type of a surgery, but you can see that it's next to the common carotid artery and inter, in, internal jugular vein. It's kind of s sandwiched right in between them. So if you're on a heartbeat, you're probably on the vagus nerve, okay? From a palpation standpoint. Pretty cool picture, though. It gives you appreciation of how large it is. It enters the thorax here, 
comes down and then starts to branch off. It starts having plexuses, and these plexuses innervate different things. You have the cardiac plexus, which will innervate the heart, specifically the AV and SA node. You'll have um, the esophageal uh, portion where it's, in, you know, it's wrapped around the esophagus, and it's, it's working on peristalsis, okay? It's helping the food come down into the stomach. Um, and then it also innervates the lungs, okay? It has, it has a branch that sends, um, you know, some nerve innervation to the lungs. It then passes down and into the stomach, okay? Note here, you have the phrenic nerve coming down, and that is innervating the diaphragm as well, okay? And they, they are pretty close to each other. You see where, where the phrenic nerve is. It's a little bit more lateral from, from the vagus nerve, which is here. Another illustration here, as it comes down, it passes through the uh, esophageal hiatus, right through here, and the esophagus comes down through the diaphragm, and then you see how it kind of fans out and innervates the stomach. It, this illustration doesn't show it, but the next one does. How it passes through into the thorax, it also innervates the pancreas, stomach, the spleen, the uh, ascending and transverse colon, and some of the small intestines, okay? So all these plexuses have certain purposes, but all this feedback from the viscera is coming through the vagus nerve and back to the brain, okay? Here's an illustration of, of how you have the vagus nerve coming down and innervating the SA and AV node, and that is your parasympathetic control, and that control is designed to decrease heart rate, slow it down, okay? Respiration, okay? It has a role in respiration. The diaphragm, as we said, was innervated by the phrenic nerve, okay? The vagus nerve has a role in respiration. When you have a functional diaphragm, one that is working and you're breathing correctly, the diaphragm actually works as a pump in the body, okay? Up and down through breathing, okay? It moves down with inhalation, moves up with exhalation, okay? That pumping mechanism influences the parasympathetic and sympathetic control of heart rate and gut motility. If you take that out, you do not have efficient heart rate control and motility, okay? Which is why people who have vagus nerve dysfunctions also have gastroparesis. They have decreased motility because, the, because in this uh, diagram, you'll see the vagus nerve is responsible for stimulating gastrointestinal activity, not slowing it down. It slows down heart rate. So as, as heart rate increases, motility decreases. And as heart rate increases, uh, as heart rate decreases, motility increases, and vice versa. As you breathe, you see how that might be important, right? Any questions on that? Is that straightforward? Okay, so this is just an illustration of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves, nervous systems. Okay, they are both part of the autonomic nervous system. Um, parasympathetic rest and digest, sympathetic flight fight or flight, okay? These are the functions of the vagus nerve here and what they do, okay, under parasympathetic control. And we also have to talk about the third part of the, of the autonomic nervous system, which is the entric nervous system, okay? The entric nervous system is the intrinsic nervous system of the gastrointestinal system. It is described as the second brain of the human body, okay? And it is the connection that gets coined the, the brain-gut access. It is that sensory feedback from the gut to the brain. And it has influences on people's mood. It has, people on, it has influences on anxiety, stress, and all that. If you have a dysfunctional gut, it can cause numerous problems in the system. Okay? We'll get a little more into that in a minute. So relevant pathology. Okay? Am I going too fast? Is everyone okay? Impaired diaphragmatic breathing. Okay? We talk, I showed you a little bit before about the pumping mechanism, but... There's two types of breathing. One is chest breathing. I breathe up through my chest, okay? This is dysfunctional breathing. You see a lot of people doing this, but if, if you do it yourself, okay, and you breathe up, you'll feel how your back goes into extension. You'll feel hinges in your lum lumbar spine, lumbothoracic spine, and you'll feel hinges in your cervical spine. This constant dysfunctional breathing can cause muscles to become spastic and tight, overused, overworked, and anytime you have hinges in your body, you're getting breakdown. Okay, diaphragmatic breathing, the correct way, is a relaxation of the gut. Okay, and you'll actually see the belly drop down when someone breathes through the diaphragm and then come in. Okay, so if you try it now, 
Take a big deep breath in, you'll feel your gut expand, and then come back, and come back. If you breathe the wrong way, you'll feel your chest come up, okay? And then you'll, you can feel that in your mid-back. So this becomes a problem if you have people with chronic low back pain, frequent tension type headaches, stress and anxiety, chronic postural strain uh, or po chronic postural dysfunctions, and then rib dysfunctions. When you have faulty postures, a lot of times you get these suboccipital muscles that get spasm or shortened, and their referred pain pattern kind of mimics that of a headache. Okay, you can see how if you palpate those two spots, okay, you palpate the suboccipital muscles, you know, it refers pain right to the temporal and occipital bones. Okay. Okay, so this this is a great illustration. Let's talk about the atlas and axis. And I told you about being off axis. Okay, this this shows normal alignment. This shows this functional alignment of C1 on C2, okay? And it shows here what, what it might look like on the, occipital, uh, on the occipital and temporal bones, okay? And you see how here, we, we already talked about how the jugular foramen was right here. So if we have a C1 dis movement dysfunction or positional dysfunction, you can see how that might get clouded right there. If that's clouded and that's, that's narrowed, just like a joint space in a of a facet joint, you can imagine that anything coming out of there might be pinched, correct? Just like if we have a back problem, we get neural tension down the leg. This is the same concept. It's a nerve, okay? And it's also some, we have blood flow going through there as well. So you'll have patients that will come in and they'll describe feeling cloudy, not feeling right, getting lightheaded, and then all the other symptoms that we'll talk about in a minute. But this right here is a huge problem. And faulty posture can influence that. Trauma can influence that. You know, repetitive repetitive um, holding patterns can influence that as well. Okay, sleeping can influence that. Like if you're not sleeping in the correct position, a lot of times stiff neck is is just that. It's a, it's an acute dysfunction of C1. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about headaches. Three types of headaches: cervicogenic, migraine, and tension type. I want to focus primarily on this right now, and we'll talk about migraines in a second. Um, cervicogenic headaches tend to be unilateral, okay, and they tend to be reproduced by neck movement and pressure over the upper cervical spine, okay. Pain referred from source in the neck and perceived in one or more regions of the head. The mechanism uh, which is responsible for pain consists of a merger of the spinal nerve, C1, C2, C3, and the trigeminal nerve, okay. The merger of the nerve makes it possible the upper cervical spine to radiate pain into the regions of the head, okay? The clinical presentation of a cervicogenic headache tends to be unilateral dominant headache exacerbated by neck movements, tenderness of the upper cervical spine, like I said, and weakness of the deep neck flexors. Migraines. Okay, and everyone's familiar with these two topics, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but you know, we're going to have a whole lecture on migraines. But the differentiation between migraines and headaches is that migraines tend to be much more severe, okay, and they have phases of them. There's typically th four phases of a migraine. You have um, prodrome, um, aura, migraine, and postrome, okay? And a lot of times in migraines, you're going to have an aura, you're going to have some type of visual disturbance, okay, so that separates itself from a tension type or a cervicogenic headache because you don't have those with those type of headaches. Um, and then the conventional treatment for migraines, and if you have a patient who's coming with migraines before, you know that medication is number one, okay, but someone who has migraine pain has tried everything to get rid of them, especially chronic migraines. They will do anything that someone tells them to try to get rid of it, anything. And a lot of times, it's, it doesn't help. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't help. But they, they do have some effect. I have a lady right now who's, who's using Botox, and she says it helps, but it's not, it's not the end all. The problem with medication is that it causes other things. Patients are on multiple medications, trial medications, switch this medication to this medication, and the, si the side effects and the effects on someone's system is, is probably not worth what you're, the benefit of, of the medication. Um, but that's not... That's not our scope of practice. You know, we, we have can only do what we can to help them with their musculoskeletal issues. Okay. 
vagus nerve dysfunction, okay? There's two types of vagus nerve dysfunction. There's underactive and overactive. And in an underactive state, the vagus nerve has, it's, it, it has an influence on the gastrointestinal tract and slows motility. It's called gastroparesis. Okay, and in overactive, this is where you've probably heard of vasovagal syncope, okay? You have a, a dramatic decrease in heart rate, which causes people to faint, okay? Let me go back for a second. It's the chronic nature of this dysfunction that, that is probably going to lead more to what we're talking about today. The, not the acute stages of it. It's more the chronic, okay? The other, other things that you see with chronic vagus nerve dysfunction is you know, dysphagia, okay, risk of aspiration, inhibited gag reflex, changes in, in people's voice, maybe hoarse or, or not able to you know, pronunciate real loud, uh, uncontrolled inflama inflammation, and anxiety and depression. And anxiety and depression, because if it's not active, then the sympathetic control takes over, and we can't calm ourselves down as we should be able to. Okay, the, the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system work to control each other, correct? If one's not working, the other one's out of control. Okay. GERD uh, is basically acid reflux, um, and what happens here is the lower esophageal sphincter um, gets inhibited, gets dysfunctional, um, and you have regurgitation of, of you know, gastric juices up into the esophagus. Symptoms include heartburn, chest pain, difficulty swallowing, and regurgitation of food. So why is this important? Because hiatal hernia is typically the primary cause of acid reflux and GERD. Okay? Everyone familiar with hiatal hernia, but um, this is what it is. It's, it's, it's a movement of the upper portion of the stomach through the esophageal hiatus and getting stuck. There's actually two types. One is sliding, and one is where you're actually stuck out laterally to it. Okay. Um, this one I believe is is easily a little bit easier to treat as opposed to this one. Symptoms of hiatal hernia include heartburn, regurgitation, acid reflux, difficulty swallowing, chest or abdominal pain, shortness of breath, and heart palpitations. So when you get a patient who comes in who's got these symptoms, you can easily screen for it. And you might have an idea of what could be influencing these symptoms. A lot of the patients that come in with a hiatal hernia have no idea what's wrong with them. And they, unless they've been tested with a, you know, an endoscopic procedure, probably have been just kind of like, oh, you know, try this medication, hopefully it helps, and try this and hopefully it helps. But they've never been treated for the actual issue. So what does our research say? Okay, I, initially when I did this presentation, I had like an overwhelming number of research studies, and I was like, holy cow, there's so much out there, and I, I did this. I just narrowed it down. It was too much. It's overwhelming. If you want to go out there and explore it, it's there. It's just a quick search, and it's like, Pfft. okay. So I narrowed it down to um, studies that showed re you know, they were reviewing all the literature, as opposed to showing you individual pieces of literature. So this is a comprehensive review, and it said currently sufficient ev evidence exists linking the increased frequency of severe gastrointestinal disorder with migraines, okay, compared to the general public. And the brain-gut axis plays an important role in the association between gastrointestinal or disorders and migraines. I think it's pretty powerful, okay? And here are some of the gastrointestinal issues that have been linked with migraines, okay? They're pretty common, okay? And here is another study that reviewed the literature and found that all of these gastrointestinal issues were linked with people who had higher rates of migraines. Okay. So what's the missing link? The studies that are out there are having trouble linking why this was influencing this. Okay. Until so someone by the name of Mima Ojeda said the vagus nerve is that link between the gastric gastrointestinal tract and the brain. Okay. <coughs> really interesting article she she had up. And any kind of gastrointestinal stress can put pressure on the vagus nerve and cause irritation, with the hiatal hernia being a frequent culprit. Okay. Um, Jill, yes. Did they say there <coughs> three slides back? Did you say it's uh, associated with um, this one? Or one more with celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So here's interesting, right here, um, any type of irritation. So if I have a hiatal hernia, I already know that, and this is why I went through this cascade of, of anatomy. 
my vagus nerve comes through the, the esophageal hiatus. If I have a hiatal hernia, am I putting stress on that nerve? Yes, it's a nerve. If I put stress on a nerve at anywhere in my leg or my arm, I'm going to have symptoms, okay? If I have um, buildup of acid, okay, in that area, that can influence negatively, just like inflammation can influence a nerve. So any type of inflammation can cause the vagus nerve to send signals back to the brain that, you know, that something is not right. And these other symptoms that occur, you know, we talked about the, the symptoms of GERD. You know, these are all symptoms that might indicate that we have vagus nerve dysfunction. Okay. There's a lot of articles out there that say that hiatal hernia is, is a lot more common than we all think. Okay. So how can these patients benefit from physical therapy? And what do we do? All right? What have I done in the clinic that, that has supported some of this stuff? I think subjective history is, is critical. Okay. Um, taking a good medical history is always important. Uh, but when you have a patient who comes in who feels like they've, you know, they've got migraines and they have failed attempts, got to dot, you got to dig a little deeper. You got to ask them, have you ever had difficulty swallowing? Have you ever had acid reflux, heartburn? You have to ask them the questions that are not typical and have them tell you no before you rule it out. So review of symptoms, linking events, um, you know, a traumatic fall that might have stre stretched the vagus nerve, okay, and then it got into a dysfunctional state. Um, you know, I have had numerous patients who have had trauma to their head. I've had numerous patients who have had um, stuff done to their, you know, they've had TMJ, chronic TMJ issues, and they didn't realize that that might have caused them to have this migraine. And now they have all these systemic issues that they didn't know were linked to this one incident where they had, you know, um, a TMJ issue 10 years ago. So you have to dig a little bit, okay? And one of the ladies in our, and I'm going to do three case studies later, one of the ladies had, had Bell's palsy, you know, so it's pretty interesting stuff. Okay. Um, and then you want to do a, a thorough upper quadrant examination on these patients. Posture is always critical, okay? Um, we always want to assess posture, recommend, you know, exercises that can assist with the posture and, and work on re-education of that posture. Um, Poor posture can can also also alter the position of the stomach. I mean, you can see in the picture here, you can alter the position of the stomach based on your, your holding patterns, um, and that can influence you know the stomach's position, influencing the vagus nerve as well. Okay. Upper cervical mobility and alignment. You now we talked about before getting C1 back on access. Okay, you can taking pressure off of that area where the where the cranial nerves exit out of the jugular frame. Working on deep neck flexor strength, okay, and postural strength. Resolving any issues you might have with the thoracic girdle, okay? So if I have dysfunctions of rib one, rib two, um, if I have you know, manubrium or T1, T2 that's not, not positioned right, I always tell my patients, they're like, why are you working down there? I'm like, well, because if you were to build a house, that your head, head sits on, would you want a, a solid foundation or would you want one that's off? And so you have to work on the foundation before you work on resolving the upper cervical restrictions, okay? Or you're beating a dead horse. Okay. Resolving any upper limb tension, okay? Uh, tension type headaches, um, you know, chronic migraines. I had a lady who um, we all we did was, was neural tension and her headaches were decreasing because that was her major motion impairment. She just could not, every time she used her arm you know, repetitively, she had a migraine, she had a headache, okay? So you, know, you have to look at the entire system and, and see what's, what's influencing it, what might be contributing to these headaches. Breathing, okay? Focusing and educating patients on the importance of breathing. It's critical. Um, and in my practice, I would say over the last two, three years that this has become something I've done with almost every single one of my patients. Um, that's coming to me uh, with any type of spinal issue or, you know, or neck issue, okay? Visceral mobility, I do recommend taking advanced con ed courses and not just going in there and just digging around. But, um, you know, you want to be able to know your contraindications and, and indications for when to do it, okay? Learning or having references to um, visceral referred pain patterns is, is really important, okay? Just having this as a resource, to look up if you're if they're not if if your assessment is not matching up you know um i mean um with mobility testing okay this is another another thing to go to this is like your zebra but it's still out there you want to rule it out 
Cranial nerve testing, we're going to focus primarily today on the, um, the vagus nerve, okay? The vagus nerve, if you have a dysfunctional vagus nerve, which I've seen clinically, you will have a deviation of the uvula, okay? So the ah test, all right? And then your gag reflex. You can have people with absent gag reflex or hyperactive gag reflexes, okay? Exercises that we use to, to work on with these patients, I usually don't give them a lot, okay? But I usually always start with diaphragmatic breathing. I work on a, an exercise called pivot prone, which works on getting, you know, uh, open, expanding the chest and getting people in a better, better posture, getting stretched out and working on the posterior depressors of the scapula. Um, I work on low to long duration stretches of, of the upper thoracic spine where they're just laying down over a pillow. You know, these people have so many things going on. Lay down, but lay down this way, you know, and it stretches out their upper, upper thoracic spine. I will work on deep neck flexor strength and give them postural strength exercises. Okay. Other considerations: when to refer, who to refer to. Okay. These are a good list of people to refer to. You always want to make sure that people's diet and water intake are are, are good. So referring to a, a nutritionist, um, psychiatrist. You know, if they're having a lot of stress and anxiety because of these migraines, uh, where you, you know. Have, giving them coping mechanisms, you know, sometimes that's outside of our scope of practice. We want to make sure we send them to the right people to get what they need from a multidisciplinary approach. And then education, how to take medication, when to take medication. Um, and then I find this to be critical with our patients with migraines is sleeping and sitting posture. Okay. So clinical presentations. Okay. I'm going to go through three of them. Case study one, 41 year old female. Um, medical diagnosis was bilateral occipital neuralgia, chronic migraine without aura, classic migraine with aura, vertigo, myalgia, dizziness, and giddy giddiness. I like that. She had a chronic history of 20 years of neck pain and headaches with symptomatic migraines one to two times a week varying for several hours to three days in duration with high pain intensity. And the other symptoms here and other issue she has, which, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, vomiting, hyperactive gag reflex, tachycardia, and tinnitus, ringing in the ear. Prior treatments included medication, Botox, and chiropractor, okay? Um, this lady had an inability to breathe diaphragmatically, no, neck no deep neck flexor strength. She had a shear of C1. She had severe tightness in her scalene. She had a, a rip of upper rib hypermobility. Um, and she had, this is the lady with the severe neural tension. She could only get to about here bilaterally. Um, and she also had a positive slump and a positive straight leg raise test without any symptoms of lower extremity dysfunction. Okay. So this is what I'm saying. We're treating the entire body. Okay. So this lady, uh, came a few months, 18 treatments, no headaches. The longest she went without a headache was three and a half weeks. Um, she reported increased ability to work, perform daily activities, participate in social activities, had less anxiety regarding potential headaches, and knew how to manage them better. Uh, she wrote a really nice review on our Facebook page at our, from our office, and uh, still keep in contact with her now. A lot of these patients you'll find when you're done with them, you still have to follow up with them. They follow up with you, and, and they come in for routine checkups. If they start having headaches more than like once every few weeks, they're like, <laughs> I'm coming back in. Okay, so they start to find value in, in the conservative treatment as opposed to the medication. All right, case two, 42-year-old female, 10-plus year history of chronic migraines. Increased frequency and uh, increased frequency of intention starting in July of 2016, one to three times a week she was having these headaches. Pain was four, four to ten at worst. Here's her other symptoms. Okay, so this is why your subjective component becomes critical. Prior treatments, all this, and her photo, which is an outcome measure that we use in, in therapy to kind of give us a gauge of how how good she should do. Uh, and so they, she started with a 59 out of 100. Her predicted score was 65 in 11 visits. Okay, I'll have to go back a little bit. Uh, major findings with her: C1 sheared, C2 in, rotated and in, in, unable to. Um, rotate in the opposite direction, uh, poor diaphragmatic breathing, and she has severe, severe tenderness in the left upper abdominal quadrant. So right here over the 
basically just just inferior to the um, cyphoid process. Okay, so basically where you know, your your esophagus is coming down right here and doing like a little turn into the stomach here, and so this is the area where you're going to have your hiatal hernia. I didn't diagnose her with one. I don't know if she had one, but I pressed here with light touch. She jumped off the table. Okay. <clears throat> And the reason I went there was because of this, right? <coughs> and this. Three treatments, no meds. Increased bowel movements. It's always awesome to talk to your patients about how frequently they go to the bathroom, but it's important, okay? <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. How often do you go to the bathroom? Um, pain was 2 out of 10 at, at worst. Okay, after five treatments in 21 days, her photo score went to a 72. Okay, 80% improvement, no meds. Currently managing without meds and receives treatment as needed. It's pretty neat. Okay. Last case, 42-year-old female. And it didn't dawn on me until I was going through the sides last night. 42, 41, 42 females. Okay. I'm not going to draw any conclusions from that. However, that is pretty interesting. Okay. I chose three case studies randomly, and then I put it down on paper, and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. So just... That, that is the age group, you know, somewhere in that age range, you know, that if you have a patient coming in with these type of symptoms, you might want to might want to consider this stuff. This is the neatest one, okay, 42-year-old female. She'd been to therapy before. She was actually in therapy with me for Bell's palsy two years uh, in 2013. But she was referred to therapy because she was having increased episodic neck pain and headaches. She was also having right arm pain. Um, this, these symptoms had been going on for about three to four years, but everything seemed to be getting worse recently, which made her go, she wasn't even able to really function. Her headaches were four to six times per week, and here are other symptoms. That was because I asked her to do it. This is when she came into the office and we started talking a little bit more. She was like, oh, I got to add this. I got to add this. I got to add this. So th this is a crazy patient, right? This patient's crazy, right? So that you know that's what we typically do. We're like, oh gosh, what do we do with this person? She had distorted speech. She slurred. Okay, her husband said she was Russian. You know, she was just like all over. The, she could not, she could not get her words out. She ha was suffering from uh, frequent sinus infections and parotid gland infections. Okay, she had frequent sore throats unilaterally. She had at times a loss of her voice. She had loss of taste on the right side. She was dealing with constipation, heartburn, acid reflux, constant hiccups, heart palpitations, difficulty swallowing where she actually aspirated and stopped eating certain foods because she was fearful that she might die. And she had ear pain on the right side. Everything was on this side, okay? There was nothing asymptomatic on the left side. She had this feeling in her face that someone was taking rubber bands and pulling them apart, okay? She had seen. Uh, I don't. I didn't. Don't think I. I wrote down here. She had seen every specialist under the sun. Okay. She came to us because she was worried about her right arm. She just wanted her right arm pain to go away. And so I started just talking to her, and then I made her do this, and then we just explored it, and I educated her on, hey, can you just go home and read about this type of dysfunction? And she did, and she came back, and she was like, that's when she's like, I had all this stuff on. Okay, but this typically, when you get someone with this many symptoms, are, are <laughs> red flag, right? She had a, a, a uvula that deviated to the left. So, you know, with, with testing, uh, I tried to videotape, but I, I can't work my, my cell phone all that good, so I messed up. But it deviated to the left. She had no gag reflex. I could literally jam the thing in the back of her throat, and she was like, <laughs> she had a sear one that, C1 that was severely sheared towards that right side. She had a limitation in C1 to C2, two right rotation. Um, her trachea and esophagus did not move to the left at all. Like if I was to mobilize her anterior cervical spine, including the esophagus and the trachea, there was just no movement. When I did an odd test with her, okay, the glottis is what, um, if you guys are familiar with the glottis, okay. Um, when I moved her to the, the right, her glottis functioned normally. She could go, ah, uh, you guys can do this on yourselves. Uh, you shouldn't change. When I moved her to the left, it went, she went, ah, uh, I shut it off. It just closed it down. It did not work. Okay. So you should be able to move your trachea and your glottis from side to side and your ah uh, sound should not change. Okay. 
So that was severely restricted. She had tenderness over the left upper and right lower abdominal quadrant. So she was severely tender here and she was unable to breathe diaphragmatically. She was like, what are you talking about? Okay. Five treatments, 60% improved, one a headache in three weeks, improved speech, swallowing, endurance, cervical range of motion and use her right upper extremity. Her photo score improved 50%, which matched her subjective basically, which was great. Um, you know, from 54 to 59 and made predicted 64. She's still coming. It's only five treatments. It's pretty cool. Last night was her fifth. It's really cool stuff. Now, the other things I didn't put on here is the band, the rubber band in her face is gone. Her uvula is straight up and down. I still can jam her with her gag reflex. It doesn't change. But she's able to turn her head to the right. She went from not being able to do more than 10,000 steps um, a day where she was tracking. She likes to exercise. She, she had gained a, a bunch of weight. So she was tracking her steps. If she did more than 10,000 uh, steps in a day, she was miserable. She just couldn't function the next day. She's unlimited right now. She's just like, I, I, don't, I don't even think about it anymore. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Plus, it's getting nice outside. So, All right. So questions. I know it's a lot of information. Go ahead. Does the usually go to the opposite side of the injury? Or to yes. The injury? No, it goes to the opposite. It's pulled, pulled by the functional side, and it deviates away from the dysfunctional side. Go ahead. Um, I'm here because my daughter has chronic migraines. Mm -hmm. I'm a physical therapist. Um, Thank you, though. Thank you for coming. Well, I needed to be here. She's 28. But she's had chronic migraines her whole life. But she recently has issues with the gallbladder. And I'll be looking at maybe surgery. I'm just curious about so that's, that's a, the gallbladder thing is outside my scope. So if she has a, a specialist that's uh, assessing her for that, and she has this functional gallbladder, I'd say that's kind of separate. separate. However, the fact that she has at 28 some some already some you know GI issues, potentially you know there there could be there could be a connection you know and again you have to, every case is different. Those three cases were completely different, both from present presentation and treatment. There's some you know some correlation between the treatments because you know a lot of the stuff is, is is the findings are the same, but they're all different. You said you take a pretty comprehensive history. Yeah. Did these patients report that they felt like they were getting sick more easily? With like the therapy? Just, no, just in general. Like the one, the only one patient described being sick more frequently. Um, but the nausea and vomiting that people get with the headaches, that seems to resolve after we after we work on them. Okay, And I think that nausea and vomiting is, is, is typical of a migraine, but the reason why is you know, still uh, you know being explored, right? Yes. So I will characterize myself as the second crazy lady. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, so I'm 44 years old. I've had chronic migraines probably from when I was a senior in high school. Uh -huh. um, they started after I was hit head on um, in a car accident. And I've done everything. I've had medications where I've been on like 12 medications at a time. Currently I take six different medications to manage my migraines. I have celiac disease. Uh, I have a hyaluronic hernia. I have GERD. Um, with celiac disease, you go to the bathroom uh, an exorbitant amount of times per day. But as I got older, now I take medication to help me go to the bathroom. Um, I, literally, I have neck pain all of the time. I have terrible posture. I, I could say that I probably have rounded shoulders, forward head, and I don't maintain a posture like this because it makes my stomach sick. So I always hold my head almost in an <coughs> extended position and I look up, which anytime I bring my neck down, literally I make myself sick to the stomach. So <laughs> I could probably go on and on and on with my system, uh, my symptoms. So where do I go first? I have a neurologist, I have a gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. I've tried massage, I've tried acupuncture, I've tried um, therapy in the past. Uh, and I still suffer from chronic headaches to the point where I have them for like a couple hours per day or I have them for four days out of the week. Hmm. So what are your recommendations? <laughs> no idea. You sound crazy. <laughs> no, no, but that's, that's, where, that's where the medical industry has led us to. And this is why I'm so sensitive to this topic because I'm getting people that come in with the diagnosis of crazy. Right. I also have PMJ, 
when I was a senior in college, I was bending over and at the same time I was standing up from getting my bag, one of my classmates stuck his arm through his coat and hit me here and dislocated me here. Right. So, <laughs> so that's what there's linking events. That's that's the important no one might have thought of that, but if you link the events, like, oh that's trauma to this area. I'm not saying I'm not saying that all the other symptoms are from that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's important to go back and have them. Have you ever have trauma to this area? Ever have a, a car accident? Ever have something? People then start to be like, oh, the truth serum comes out. They start thinking of things because they don't link these events. You have to link it for them. I always chalked it up to me having celiac disease. With celiac disease, you are migraines are common. common. Very common. I've had celiac disease for 18 years that I know of, diagnosed. Uh, it was interesting that one slide that you had all of like the referred pain patterns of yes. dysfunction. Can you go back to that slide? Yeah. You see where it says like the stomach and it's that blue right yeah. there between the shoulder blades? Yeah. I have chronic pain there. To the point where I've asked Joe to like, please fix my spine because I have such aching pain there. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting to see that. So I was like, oh, wow, interesting. So, so one thing I was thinking of throughout the presentation is we talked a lot about how the neck could affect the stomach, but I think that the other part of that is how many of these patients do you think had some sort of gastrointestinal problem before they had neck pain? Because I think that we talk a lot about central sensitization for the rest of the spine and the rest of the nervous system. And to me, I feel like if your stomach is constantly giving your vagus nerve signals, you're going to have almost the same <coughs> phenomenon through the vagus nerve up to your neck. And I think a lot of times we end up with neck people, those who have chronic stomach pain and upper neck pain because of that. Yeah, so yeah. you irritate the nerve, it becomes dysfunctional or inflamed right. down here, and it influences the the, you know, the elasticity of it, you know, so that, that in a sense is neural tension. Neural tension, when you're dealing with muscles and joints and ligaments, have feels one way. But in your autonomic nervous system, it's got to feel a different way. And I think it feels different because we have symptoms as opposed to pain. Right? Like there's more symptom symptoms that are in, you know influencing multiple organs. Okay, and that sensory feedback is flooding the brain. Okay. When um, these symptoms that I presented are supposed to be uh, things you want to work on the body to work like maintaining this feeling. Yeah, um I was gonna say, have you seen this in the elder? So far no. You know, not 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 as not as frequently. I don't doubt that they have it. But I think there's a high correlation, high correlation to postpartum, you know, and, and you think about it when, when you're pregnant, everything gets pushed up. The man's got to drop back down. What if it doesn't drop back down? What if that nerve gets shortened and then what if the irritation happens out there? So you got to ask them that. You know, symptoms present before pregnancy or after? I should have touched that man. But before or after, okay? All three of them are mothers. C-section also I would be a little bit more heightened to, okay? Um, what would you call this? Like, obviously, this therapy, but what would the name be so I can put my daughter on? <laughs> when she gets to her gallbladder issue? You know, I, it's, it's hard to put a label on it. Um, okay. Manual therapy. Physical just therapy. Manual therapy, yeah. Manual. If I say it's, can you look into the vagus nerve? Approach, you know, so yeah, well, where does she live? She in Harrisburg area. It would be someone who's skilled in... Um, Visceral mobilizations. I, I, you know, someone who specializes in, in manual therapy. Okay. Um, if you get, in con I can give you my contact information. We can find someone out there that that does work on it. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. You didn't touch on what kind of treatment. In the sense. Oh, I. Okay, I'll go back. So basically, the slides. A lot of things I was doing are hands-on hands-on approaches with these patients. Very little exercise, but mostly hands-on. And I had I'd gone through and said, you know, addr addressing these type of issues in through here, okay? A lot of it is hands-on. These patients aren't doing like strenuous exercises in the gym at all, you know? They're just coming in, they're laying down. We're doing some things like the one lady said, I have no idea what he does to me. When he's done, I'll feel better, <laughs> okay? Less is more. I tried not to explain a lot of what I'm doing. I'll give a little bit, um, especially like if I'm touching a sensitive area as to why it hurts. Um, but it's usually the the end result, they're like, do that again. Okay, because they, they notice a difference. Go ahead. Do you have any 
excited. That's for the green team. Um, since we're free and appreciate that we will be on as sanitary as a 42 year old woman looking for someone's more active or has an extra job and is younger, um, who can't do those mobilizations by themselves. They're really excited for maintaining that. Yeah, I, I typically end them with a lot of the strengthening, like a lot of like stretches and postural strengthening exercises because posture has a huge influence on this. Um, you can't say that it's going to be gone, okay? Um, I would say none of these patients are are 100%, okay? But they're better than where they were. And from the medication and, and the other consultations they've had, the other types of treatment, the results for them are better with the conservative <coughs> manual therapy than it is with you know the band-aids that they've been putting on in the past okay and they all three of them will will swear up and down by by the type of treatment that they received and are happy with it which is great um but didn't expect it when they came they had no it's like going to a good movie but you didn't know you just knew that someone said hey watch this movie watch it and you're like wow oh, that was great I, I think that's a lot of times they don't know that they're coming for for this type of treatment but we explore and we you know i i um you know, through conversation and then through uh, education and then results, they, they tend to really like buy in. Okay. It's an overwhelming amount of information to try to, to try to explain to them what I'm doing. Okay. Um, I know you were talking about taking a pretty thorough history. Do you ever explore the birth history or any of the developmental history just because we're coming from the pediatric perspective from PT and we see a lot of developmental disorders? Um, that could lead to things like this. I think that's really important for people who have had issues early in age, like younger. But subjectively, with these three cases and the majority of my cases, it's been there's been an event, and after that event. Whereas I think if you have someone who comes in and be like, I've had migraines since I was you know little. We have no idea when I was when I was little. I had you know celiac disease or I had Crohn's, like whatever they might have had from a young age. You know, colicky baby, right? There's, there's articles out there that say colic is a hiatal heart, but I'm not going there. <laughs> but if I had another baby and they were colic, I'd probably do the mobilization. <laughs> I would do anything to get, get them better. But any other questions? Okay. Um, any any let, questions let, online? Let, lastly, real quick, um, wanted to go over what happened. Sorry. You're not listening. Sorry, lastly, real quick. Um, don't artificially limit your scope of practice, okay? Know when to refer. Teen education and mentoring is critical, okay? Push yourselves to go outside of your comfort zone as a therapist, okay? And learn. Um, we need to have an intent to notice, okay? So when someone comes to you and you think that they're crazy, listen to them a little bit more. Ask some more questions, okay? When you don't know, it's okay to refer, okay, to someone that might have dealt with this in the past, but don't, don't not try. Pattern recognition over the course of years, seeing things, hearing things, will lead you to be able to go down a cascade of questions, and and you know when you're interviewing the patient to help guide your hypothesis. The subjective is critical, and I also think that as therapists, as medical professionals. We need to challenge ourselves to be knowledgeable of how all sy 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 systems interact in the body, okay, and how those influence our systems that we're more specialized at, okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you.